Roy Shulman is going to speak about the signs of the times and things that really affect each and every one of us. He will be highlighting on the rise of Islam, the great apostasy, and the conversion of the Jews and the second coming of our Lord. And here we are, a Jewish mommy calls her Jewish son, Roy Shulman. The, um, because today I want to talk more specifically about, uh, as Al said, the signs of the times, what we know is going to have to happen to precede the second coming and the role of the conversion of the Jews in that equation. Um, let me, though, uh, begin by kind of picking up from where I left off yesterday and saying that, uh, as I tried to make clear yesterday, when I entered the Catholic Church, very gratefully, having been born and raised Jewish, it seemed to me that I had not converted at all, but I had just gone, as I said yesterday, from being a Jew who was wrong about who Jesus was to a Jew who was right about who Jesus was, because if the Catholic faith is true, the Catholic Church is nothing but the continuation of Judaism after the coming of the Jewish Messiah. And that for all intents and purposes, uh, Judaism was pre-Messianic pre Catholicism, and the Catholic Church is post-Messianic Judaism. Um, let me try to flesh this out by beginning at the very beginning of the story, which is, of course, um, God's creation of man, Adam, in the Garden of Eden. When God created man, he originally created him to live in a state of uninterrupted bliss and intimacy with God from his creation till the end of time, right, in the Garden of Eden. When man chose to sin, that initial blissful, uninterrupted intimacy between God and man was ruptured, and man fell, but at that very moment, God knew that someday in the future, he would not only restore man to that elevated state into which he had originally created him, but actually to a far more exalted state through the incarnation of the second person of the Most Holy Trinity as a man at some future point in time. If the second person of the Most Holy Trinity was going to incarnate as a man at some future point in time, it would be um, at a particular point in time, among a particular people, in a particular spot in the world, even in the womb of a particular virgin, and of course that people would have to be prepared. They would have to be separated out from all of the other uh, essentially pagan peoples roaming the earth. They would have to be kept separate for almost 2,000 years while they were given a tremendous amount of divine revelation. First of all, to know about the creation of man, to know about the one true creator God, to know about the fall of man, the seriousness of sin, the need for redemption, the need for a coming redeemer. They would have to be given enough divine revelation to recognize the redeemer when he came, and they would have to be given enough of a foundation in theology to make sense of what was happening and to spread the new religion to the four corners of the earth after the redeemer came. And that's what the Jews were. You could think of them as you know, one insignificant people chosen at random from all the people on the earth, but for this most privileged and exalted role that God ever chose for any particular ethnic people. Now, given um, that he chose the Jews, for this exalted role, one could say, what a shame that they blew it and didn't recognize the Messiah when he came. But it only takes a short second look to see that that can't possibly be true. They can't possibly have blown it, right? Because they were chosen to bring about the incarnation and the incarnation came about. And they were chosen to spread the gospel to the four corners of the earth and the gospel has been spread to the four corners of the earth. There could hardly be two billion plus Christians in the world of which one billion Catholics if the Jews had failed in their task, right? They obviously must have succeeded in their task. So what about this other side of this mystery, which is their failure to recognize Jesus, and what's that got to do with uh, the role of the Jews in between the first and second coming, and what's that got to do with the second coming? And I want to get to that, but I just want to cut out, carve out a little bit of space here for a little bit of a, a tangent, which is why did God choose the Jews? There are at least three answers one can make to that question. One is he had to chose somebody, and whoever he chose, we'd be saying to ourselves today, why on earth did he choose them? Um, another reason is because 
Um, well, God makes it clear. We've, we've heard talk about several of uh, other uh, Marian apparitions this weekend, including um, uh, the apparition, excuse me, not Marian apparition, apparition of Jesus to St. Mary, Margaret Mary Alacoque, the Sacred Heart apparitions. Um, and um, Jesus made it very clear at the time why he chose St. Margaret Mary Alacoque. She asked him, why are you choosing me to be the recipient of these revelations? And Jesus said, oh, that's very simple. If I could have found anyone else more worthless and insignificant than you, I would have chosen her instead. And we know that God, as a normal pattern, chooses the most worthless and insignificant for his special favors, just so that everybody knows that what's happening is coming from God and isn't due to their own merit. And we know this in the case of uh, God choosing the Jews explicitly. It's in um, the Old Testament, in Ezekiel chapter 16. Uh, the words of um, God himself, uh, this is Ezekiel chapter 16, starting with verse 3. God tells the Jews why he chose them for this role, and he says, Thus says the Lord God to Jerusalem, On the day you were born, your navel string was not cut, nor were you washed with water to cleanse you, nor rubbed with salt, nor swathed with bands. And I passed you by and saw you weltering in your blood, and I said to you in your blood, Live. Then I bathed you with water and washed off your blood and anointed you with oil and clothed you with embroidered cloth and shod you with leather and covered you with silk. And your renown went forth among the nations because of your beauty, for it was perfect through the splendor which I had bestowed upon you, says the Lord God. So in this passage, God himself is saying explicitly, he's comparing the Jewish people to an infant who was considered so worthless that it was thrown out after birth, right, and not even washed of the afterbirth. And God came along and saw this total rejection and raised him up um, uh, precisely because of his insignificance. And so that is, that is the second reason why God chose the Jews. The third reason is a positive reason, and that's given in Genesis 22, and that's given in the story of Abraham's willingness to sacrifice his son Isaac. I think all of you know the story. I hope all of you are at least are somewhat familiar with the story. But let me um, briefly recap it, and you'll see why in a moment. The story is the following, which is that uh, God chose Abraham. This is before there were any Jews. Abraham is the father of the Jewish people. He chose Abraham to leave his homeland and go to what is now Israel and promised him that someday he would make him the father of a great nation. Well, the problem was his wife was infertile and they didn't have any children and Abraham was pushing 100 years old and his wife was over 80 and she still bore him no children. So where is this great nation going to come from springing from my loins? And then uh, finally, God miraculously um, enables uh, Sarah, who was Abraham's wife, to conceive, and she bears Abraham, his son, who he's been now waiting for, for, you know, 80 years. And so finally, the promise is fulfilled. And as soon as that son Isaac is about 12, 13 years old, God turns around and says to Abraham, okay, now that I've given you this son, I want you to sacrifice him to me. And um, Abraham, the, the scriptures say, Abraham got up early the next morning to go to where God told him to sacrifice his son. So not only did Abraham instantly obey, but he even got up especially early the next morning in order to obey. He took his son Isaac to the mountain that God had told him, which was called Mount Moriah. He laid the wood for Isaac's own sacrifice on his shoulders and climbed the mountain with his son Isaac in order to offer him in sacrifice on the top. And from there, I'm going to uh, read some verses from the scripture. Abraham took the wood of the burnt offering and laid it on Isaac, his son, and took in his hand the fire and the knife, and they both went together up the mountain. Isaac said to his father, Abraham, I see the fire and the wood, but where is the lamb for a burnt offering? Abraham said, God himself will provide the lamb for the sacrifice, my son. When they came to the place of which God had told them, Abraham built an altar there, laid the wood in order, and bound Isaac, his son, and laid him on the altar upon the wood. Then Abraham put forth his hand and took the knife to slay his son. But the angel of the Lord called to him from heaven and said, Abraham, Abraham. Abraham replied, here I am. The angel said, do not lay your hand on the lad or do anything to him. For now I know that you fear God, seeing you have not withheld your son, your only son from me. So Abraham lifted up his eyes and saw a ram caught in a thicket by its horns and took the ram and offered it as a burnt offering instead of his son. So Abraham called the name of that place the Lord will provide. 
And the angel of the Lord called, Abraham, called to Abraham a second time from heaven and said, because you have done this and have not withheld your son, your only son, I will indeed bless you and multiply your descendants as the stars of heaven. And in your seed shall all the nations of the earth be blessed because you have obeyed my voice. Now, that mountain that was known as Mount Moriah in the days of Abraham, 2,000 years later, had a different name. It's Mount Calvary, Mount Golgotha. If you go to Jerusalem, you will see the, um, the Temple Mount, on top of which is the rock on which Abraham bound his son Isaac for the slaughter. Um, that's on uh, what's called the Temple Mount today. If you walk about 500 yards down the same ridge, you'll come to the Church of the Holy Sepulchre, which is where Golgotha took place, where you can see the rock where the, the, uh, the crucifix, the cross, was placed on which Jesus died. As, as um, Abraham laid the wood for his son Isaac, sacrifice on his own shoulders, and Isaac climbed Mount Moriah. 2,000 years later, the Son of God took the wood for his own sacrifice on his own shoulders and climbed the very same mountain. Um, this Abraham's willingness to sacrifice Isaac is not only what earned the Jews, so to speak, the privilege of being the people to bring the Messiah to the whole world. Um, well, it is what earned them that uh, privilege to bring the Messiah to the whole world. And um, uh, it's explicit in this passage because when, when the angel says, in your seed shall all the nations of the earth be blessed, that promise was always seen in Judaism for 2,000 years, even before the coming of Christ, as the promise of the Messiah to come. Now, uh, Abraham didn't have to sacrifice his son Isaac. The angel stopped him, and Abraham turned around and saw a ram caught in a thicket by its horn and sacrificed the ram instead. Um, the, the Jews on their high holidays always blow a ram's horn, the shofar. Is, is that familiar to any of you? When they blow the shofar, they are blowing the shofar, according to Jewish theology, to remind God of this promise, because that ram that was offered in sacrifice was just to be a placeholder until the Messiah came. And when they're blowing that ram's horn, they are saying to God, remember the promise you made to Abraham to essentially send the Redeemer through his seed. Uh, so, you know, where is he already? We know where he is already, that he came 2,000 years ago. When Abraham said, God will himself provide the sacrifice uh, excuse me, God will himself provide the lamb for the sacrifice, my son. He was speaking prophetically far more deeply than he knew because God himself did provide the lamb for the sacrifice, which is Jesus, right? On the same, very same mountain. As this passage says over and over again, calls Isaac your only beloved son, your only beloved son. That's got to resonate with us as Catholics, as Christians, right? With Jesus being sacrificed, God's only beloved son. So this passage shows, um, um, it shows, I mean, it shows a tremendous amount, but it shows basically the, um, the way that the entire story of the Jews encapsulates in advance the story of the rest of salvation history, and that the Jewish people are this kind of like time marker through salvation history that are, are kind of like the, the, um, the drum beating out the rhythm for the fulfillment of salvation. Let me move on then from the role of Judaism in leading up to the first coming to the mystery of the role of Judaism in between the first and second coming and what the conversion of the Jews has to do with the second coming and why God arranged salvation history this way. Now, uh, as I said, um, on the one hand, you can say the Jews succeeded because the Messiah came and the gospel has been spread to the four corners of the earth. But on the other hand, you can say they failed because they, by and large, failed to recognize Jesus when he came. Now, what do we know about this failure of them to recognize Jesus? We know two things. We know on the one hand that the conversion of the Jews there, or the Jews' recognition of Jesus was extremely dear to his heart. We know this from Jesus' own word shortly before the crucifixion. He looked over Jerusalem on a spot on the hillside of the Mount of Olives overlooking the Temple Mount. It's still there. To this day, it's called Dominus Flavit, which is just Latin for the Lord wept. He wept over Jerusalem, saying, O oh, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, how often I would have gathered you under my wings as a mother hen gathers her chicks, but you would not. So we know he wept over the failure of his own people to receive him, but we know another side of this mystery, too, 
which is most of what I want to talk about today, which is that the Jews' failure to recognize Jesus the first time around was not simply due to their stubbornness and hard-heartedness, but was in itself a mysterious part of divine providence, was a necessary stage uh, for salvation history to go through. And we know this from sacred scripture itself. We know this primarily from the words of St. Paul in the letter to the Romans. So let me read uh, one or two verses from there, and then I'll come back to that at, at the end of today's talk. Reading from Romans 11, this is St. Paul speaking about the mystery of the Jews' failure to recognize Jesus. Israel failed to obtain what it sought. The elect obtained it, but the rest were hardened, as it is written. God gave them a spirit of stupor, eyes that should not see and ears that should not hear, down to this very day. Let their eyes be darkened so that they cannot see. I want you to understand this mystery, brethren. A hardening has come upon part of Israel until the full number of the Gentiles come in and so all Israel will be saved. Okay, pretty mysterious. A hardening has come upon a part of Israel until the full number of the Gentiles come in, and so all Israel will be saved. So what's this business about the full number of the Gentiles coming in? We know more about that from the words of Jesus himself. In Luke uh, chapter 21, Jesus again is prophesying shortly before the crucifixion. He's talking about the second coming. Jesus says, uh, the Jews will fall by the edge of the sword and be led captive among all nations, and Jerusalem will be trodden down by the Gentiles until the times of the Gentiles are fulfilled. And there will be signs in sun and moon and stars, and upon the earth distress of nations in perplexity at the roaring of the sea and the waves, men fainting with fear and with foreboding of what is coming on the world, for the powers of the heavens will be shaken." and then they will see the Son of Man coming in a cloud with power and great glory." Okay, so Jesus is clearly describing the second coming, and he's laying out a timeline. Let me walk back through this, through the timeline. So, um, starting at the beginning of that passage, the Jews will fall by the edge of the sword and be led captive among all nations. Literally fulfilled in about 72 AD, uh, Jerusalem fell to the Romans after an unsuccessful revolt, and the Jews were led captive among all nations, were led into slavery and dispersed around the world. And Jerusalem will be trodden down by the Gentiles, literally fulfilled at that point. Um, the Jews were exiled from Jerusalem and from 135 AD on uh, were not allowed to set foot in Jerusalem under pain of death. And Jerusalem was, quote, trodden down by the Gentiles, in other words, held in Gentile hands continuously from that point, about 2,000 years ago, until 1967 AD, when for the first time in almost 2,000 years, the old city of Jerusalem returned to Jewish hands. And then Jesus immediately goes into a description of the second coming, right? He says, until the times of the Gentiles are fulfilled. So he's kind of making this equation between the return of the Jews to Jerusalem and the time of the Gentiles being fulfilled, and I'll be talking about what that time of the Gentiles being fulfilled means. And then he immediately goes into a description of the second coming, signs and sun and moon and stars and distress of nations and fear and foreboding of what is coming on the world for the powers of the heavens will be shaken and the Son of Man coming in a cloud with power and great glory. Okay, so we have that timeline laid out. We know that there's another element on this timeline that I referred to yesterday, which we know as Catholics from the Catechism of the Catholic Church, which is the conversion of the Jews, which must precede uh, the second coming, uh, paragraph 674, which says, the glorious Messiah's coming is suspended at every moment of history until his recognition by all Israel. So um, I, in, a, in a few moments, I'm going to go into why God arranged things this way and what's going on with the time of the Gentiles being fulfilled and what that has to do with the great apostasy and what that has to do with the signs of the times. But let me go out of that sequence for a moment and say just this fact, just this timeline that we have, which is the um, dispersal of the Jews from Jerusalem, the return of the Jews to Jerusalem, the times of the Gentiles being fulfilled, the conversion of the Jews, and then the second coming, one can think sheds a lot of light on um, recent secular history and the reading of that recent secular history in the light of salvation history. And so I want to take a moment out of this and talk about the Holocaust and where the Holocaust might fit into this timeline of salvation history and what the Holocaust itself might tell us about where we are on this timeline and the light that the timeline sheds on the Holocaust. So um, let me spend a few moments talking about that. And I only have, I mean, you can probably tell I'm pretty much talking as fast as I can. 
And, and for a New York Jew, I hope that's pretty fast. Um, and so I'll, 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 I'm not really taking a break, but I'm just saying everything I'm saying today is in some sense what this book, Salvation is from the Jews, is all about. And the book is 350 plus pages, and obviously I'm not going to be able to flesh out everything in a 50-minute talk. Um, uh, but I'm, I mean, I'm, I'm, I feel like I'm being faithful to my heritage more than I'd like to be. But I do have, a, we'll have a book table out there and be peddling books. But let me go back to the Holocaust. Um, now, if you look at the Holocaust, it's extremely interesting that um, the Holocaust, as soon as you look at it, it's apparent that it was a direct expression of the diabolical will, that the impulse behind the Holocaust, despite the calumny that we're living under these days, that somehow the Catholic Church was too sympathetic to Hitler and somehow the Holocaust was an expression of a Christian impulse, nothing could be further from the truth. The three streams that flowed into the Holocaust visibly flowed straight from the pits of hell. Those three streams which flowed together and climaxed in the Holocaust and came straight from hell were Satanism or occultism, eugenics, and um, sexual depravity. Um, all three of which can easily be seen as coming from hell. First of all, Satanism or occultism, no less of an authority than the chief exorcist of Rome, Father Gabriella Amor, said, quote, without a doubt, Hitler was personally consecrated to Satan. Um, Hitler's uh, springboard to public life was an occult society in Munich called the Thule Society. Uh, Thule is the Germanic version of the Atlantis myth. Thule was supposedly this mythical continent in the Atlantic Ocean where the people had superpowers, they could travel through the air, they had mental telepathy and so forth. Um, this uh, continent sank under the waves of the Atlantic, but not before the super race fled to Europe and from there to Asia and uh, interbred with inferior races and lost their superpowers. But if their purity of the bloodlines could be restored through selective breeding, they would regain their superpowers. That was the origin of the Nazi Superman myth. Okay, it came straight from the legend of Atlantis, which is, of course, still with us in, in the New Age. Um, the, uh, the whole Nazi attempt to exterminate the inferior races, selective breeding, and so forth, to restore the purity of the bloodlines, the purity of the Aryan bloodlines, that came straight from this Atlantis myth to restore the superpowers of this super race that came from the, this island. Now, the head of the Thule Society in the early days of uh, Hitler's rise to power was an occultist named Dietrich Eckhart, um, who boasted that he personally initiated Hitler, opened his centers of vision, and gave him the means to communicate with the powers. Now, what's initiation from the point of view of the occultist? It's opening their centers of higher vision so that they can communicate with the spiritual world. Uh, it's true, it does give them the ability to uh, communicate with the spiritual world, but it's, of course, the fallen spiritual world. It's the demonic spiritual world. And when he said, I have uh, opened his centers of vision and given him the means to communicate with the powers, those were clearly not the powers of heaven, but the powers of hell. If anyone should doubt this, if you get a copy of Mein Kampf, the very last paragraph, Mein Kampf being, of course, Hitler's autobiography, um, the last paragraph is a dedication of the work to his mentor, Dietrich Eckhart. Um, the, the Third Reich was permeated with occultism. The SS was an occult brotherhood. Um, the initiation into the SS was an occult initiation rite. Um, Himmler, who was the head of the SS, uh, uh, believed in reincarnation. He was never without his copy of the Bhagavad Gita, which is the Hindu scriptures. He thought he was the reincarnation of a 10th century German king named Henry I, with whom he communed to get instructions. I mean. I mean, there's about 100 pages in the book on this, but it's just like, it's inescapable that occultism flowed and Satanism flowed straight into the Third Reich. And um, if you look at it carefully, and I do this in the book, the same stream of occultism that flowed into the Third Reich is the stream that is directly um, responsible for the New Age today. And the mother of today's New Age is a Helena Blavatsky, and she's called that in the New Age Almanac. The entire contemporary New Age is attributed to Helena Blavatsky, who was a, a Russian emigre from about the 1880s. And Hitler's occultism came straight from Helena Blavatsky also. Helena Blavatsky is the source of this teaching about uh, superior races and inferior races. Anyway, all of this stuff. Anyway, I just wanted to establish that that it's clear that the Holocaust was an expression of the diabolical will. Um, the um, sexual depravity I'll mention very briefly. 
but uh, the, the, the Third Reich was completely dependent on uh, sexual depravity in order to corrupt, basically cor uh, corrupt the morals of the people involved to the point where they would be party to the uh, brutality of their fellow man that, to which they were. Um, and um, uh, we do probably have some children here, so I won't go into details, but, um, but I'll just leave it at that, in fact. Uh, for, for the details you can read, the sort of details you can read the book. Um, but um, uh, let me think a moment. Of, no, I will leave it at that. I'm sorry, but I, I don't want to uh, cause problems for any, any parents with children here. Um, and the third stream that came fight straight from the pits of hell was eugenics. And in fact, if you um, look at the, uh, Hitler was named Chancellor of Germany January 30th, 1933. Within a few months, he set up the committee of, uh, what's it, what's, let me look up the name here, the Expert Committee on Questions of Population and Racial Policy to Enforce Eugenics. They passed a law calling for the compulsory sterilization of carriers of hereditary diseases, including feeble-mindedness, alcoholism, and epilepsy, uh, under which about 400,000 people were forcibly sterilized. Um, they passed a law requiring that every doctor and midwife a check off a box on the birth of a child, whether that child should be allowed to live or not, uh, based on whether the child had any um, disabilities, under which over a quarter million uh, children were, were killed at birth. And there was a continual interplay flowing back and forth between eugenics experts, between Hitler's eugenics program, which I just described, and Margaret Sanger's birth control league. Do you know, all know who Margaret Sanger was? She was the founders of Planned Parenthood. Um, the head of the German Eugenics Institute was a Dr. Ernst Rudin, who was a frequent contributor to Margaret Sanger's birth control review. Uh, Margaret San uh, by the way, uh, Margaret Sanger's birth control league is the direct predecessor to Planned Parenthood. She just changed the name. Um, there was a board member of, Plan of Planned Parenthood, of, of the birth control league, called Lothrop Stoddard, who in 1920 wrote a book called The Rising Tide of Color Against White World Supremacy, which was the foundation of the German eugenics education, to such a point that Goebbels complained to Hitler how inappropriate it was that a foreigner's book uh, should be the uh, basis of the German eugenics program, that foreigner being a, a Margaret Sanger board member. Uh, Margaret Sanger herself, in her birth control review, published uh, what she called a plan for world peace, which called for uh, concentration camps. And that, as she called for, this is in the United States in the 1930s, about five million defectives, which included um, basically everyone she didn't like, including, by the way, uh, Catholics, would be given a choice between being sterilized or uh, being segregated out on work farms for the remainder of their lives so they would not be able to reproduce. Uh, she called that her plan for world peace. Uh, so again, I, I just want to, I'm saying this for two reasons. One is I do want to underline how the Holocaust and the attempt to exterminate the Jews was a, a direct expression of the diabolical will. But I also want, uh, I'm going on this little bit of a digression in some sense, because I also do want to show or underline how the same diabolical forces that flowed into the Holocaust and the Third Reich are not only still with us today, but you could say again with us today and surging up in a way that uh, does not bode well uh, for the future. Now, um, the, uh, now, so then that raises the question, why would the devil be so intent on exterminating the Jews if they no longer had a role to play in salvation history? So now I'm getting back on the main line of my talk. And my argument is basically, I think it's easy to see the diabolical will behind the attempt to exterminate the Jews and to conclude that perhaps the devil's plan was that if he could exterminate the Jews, he could abort the second coming because he too knows scripture. We know that right when he tempted Jesus in the desert, he quoted scripture to him. The devil knows there has to be a conversion of the Jews to precede the second coming. So maybe he thought that if there are no Jews, there can be no second coming, or if there's no conversion of the Jews, there can be no second coming. Now he failed at the extermination of the Jews, but he succeeded at putting a huge roadblock in the way of the conversion of the Jews on both sides, on the Jewish side and on the Christian side. I described yesterday in my witness testimony how in my first experience of Christ, my immediate response was, let me know your name as long as you're not Christ and I have to become a Christian. And of course that was coming from an indirect effect of the Holocaust. Um, in some sense, you can't blame the Jews you know, for having that emotional reaction, but I think it's a tragedy that an indirect effect of the Holocaust has been to discourage the Christian world 
from evangelizing the Jews or even praying for their conversion. And I think to the extent that we allow that to be the effect, we are playing into Satan's hands and um, stalling, you know, putting a roadblock, an unnecessary roadblock before, you know, in the path of salvation history. So let me, as long as I'm on this uh, kind of contemporary historical um, tangent, let me um, raise one other aspect of the world today that I think sheds light on salvation history, which is the rise of Islam. Now, um, first of all, let me say, nothing I am going to say about Islam reflects on the nobility of an individual person who happens to be Muslim. And in fact, if I'm right about Islam, the Muslims are the primary victims. Um, I, I, frankly, everyone who isn't a Christian suffers from not being Christian. And if I'm right about what I'm going to say about Islam, there's a particular um, deprivation that Muslims are unfortunately subjected to. But so let me talk about Islam, which is, Islam is unique among world religions in that um, it came about after the coming of Christ, right? About 600 years after the coming of Christ. And it's based on what's supposed to be divine revelation. Muhammad went into a cave and the angel Gabriel appeared to him and gave him the, the body of revelation which became the Koran. Now, um, and it was supposedly a revelation from God. Now, there are only three logical possibilities. One is that it was in fact a revelation from God which got written down as the Koran. Another is that it wasn't a revelation at all, but uh, basically the Koran is of human origin. And the third possibility is, is that it was a revelation from the spiritual world coming from a spirit who pretends he's God, but in fact is not God. And I would argue that if you look at the content of um, Islam and of the Koran, you're kind of forced into that last conclusion. It clearly can't be a revelation coming from God since it contradicts Christianity since it says that Jesus never died on the cross, that God never had a son, that is a horrible blasphemy to ascribe a son to God, and so forth. And I, again, if I had time, I'd go through the quotes from the Koran, um, but um, I think in the interest of time, I know I ran over yesterday. Uh, maybe I'll go through a couple of uh, quotes. Uh, so these are some quotes from the Koran which are hard to reconcile, to say the least, with Christianity. Lo, God would never forgive that a partner should be ascribed to him. Whoever ascribes partners to God has indeed invented a tremendous sin. Um, that's from uh, chapter 4, verses 44 to 51. Um, another verse from chapter 4, verse uh, 171. The Messiah, Jesus, son of Mary, was only a messenger of God. Do not say three. God is only one God for it is far removed from his transcendent majesty that he should have a son. Okay, so you can't imagine a more direct contradiction of Christianity than that. So clearly, we cannot, I think, have room, to, well, I don't want to speak for anyone else. I don't have room to think that the Koran is a revelation coming from God when it contradicts uh, Christianity like that. So what about the, that it's of human origin? Theoretically possible, but uh, Muhammad was an illiterate and the Koran is extremely elaborate and elegant and literary Arabic uh, poetry and prose. Um, hard to imagine that it's of human origin. The third possibility that it's of diabolical origin, I think, um, is by far the compelling conclusion. Uh, it certainly wouldn't be the first time that the enemy of man's salvation pretended to be God and gave a revelation that he pretended was coming from God and was really uh, intended to stand in the way of man's salvation. So, um, uh, oh, and by the way, one other interesting, to me, extremely interesting aspect uh, when you look at Islam is wherever you look in Islam, you see what to me looks like a diabolical caricature. It certainly looks like a caricature of Christianity. And one of the places you see this caricature of Christianity is that just like according to uh, the Catholic Church, there has to be a conversion of the Jews uh, before the end of the world in the second coming. According to Islam, there has to be an extermination of the Jews before uh, the, uh, what they call the day of resurrection. And the quote there, is the day of resurrection will not arrive until the Muslims make war against the Jews and kill them, and until a Jew hiding behind a rock and tree, and the rock and tree will say, O oh Muslim, O oh servant of Allah, there's a Jew behind me, come and kill him. And this isn't only theoretical. Ahmadinejad, you know, the, the, um, the president of Iran, explicitly says that, his, um, that what he's trying to do is uh, essentially bring about the second coming, bring about the day of resurrection. 
and the eradication of Israel as part of that equation. Now, we know that Islam was a force that tried to wipe Christianity out of Europe, right, in the Middle Ages, that, there, that it invaded the Iberian Peninsula and turned uh, Spain Muslim, that it uh, was at the gates of Vienna and was uh, close to conquering the Holy Roman Empire, in fact, and was turned back in part through a, a rosary crusade. Um, I think it was uh, Saint Pope, it was Pope Saint Pius V who asked all of Christendom to pray the rosary to save Christendom from uh, the Islamic uh, threat. And uh, there was a, a miraculous victory of the Christian fleet at the Battle of Lepanto. And in recognition of that miraculous victory, which Pope Pius V attributed to the saying of the rosary and the intervention of the Blessed Virgin Mary, he instituted the feast day of Our Lady of the Rosary, right, which I think is October 7th. So I think that, uh, I guess what I'm saying is, um, you know, you can see some signs of the times here, uh, you, in the, or you can imagine that there's some signs of the times in uh, the Holocaust attempt to exterminate the Jews and in the current um, uh, resurgence of Islam in a way that uh, threatens the Christian identity of the West. Now, let me um, go back, I guess, uh, and kind of, uh, go into kind of a finishing up mode uh, by going back. No, I'll just talk a little bit about one other of these signs of the times, which is the great apostasy. Uh, you've heard of the great apostasy? I hope. Uh, the great apostasy is actually dogma. Um, I, I, I gave the citation yesterday um, from the uh, Catechism of the Council of Trent. And if I can find it, I will uh, give it again today. The general quote, um, this is from Article 7 of the Creed of the Catechism of the Council of Trent. The general judgment will be preceded by these three principal signs, the preaching of the gospel throughout the world, a falling away from the faith, and the coming of Antichrist. Now, the preaching of the gospel throughout the world, I think one could argue, has pretty much taken place, especially in the last 20, 30 years with technology and, and cable TV and radio and so forth. There are not a lot of places um, in the world where the gospel hasn't been preached. The coming of the Antichrist, as an American, I feel a little guilty talking about that because I'm sometimes afraid we might have just elected him, but. <laughs> so I'll talk about uh, um, the third of those signs, which is the um, falling away from the faith. I don't think it's impossible to imagine that what we're seeing now is the great apostasy. Um, Christian, uh, what used to be Christian Europe refused to acknowledge Christianity, right, in the new European constitution. Um, the, the statistics in the United States are horrifying. Uh, it's something like 20% of Catholics believe in the re real presence. Um, I mean, we're all familiar with the, um, um, what certainly, well, I mean, all you have to do, especially, uh, you know, as, as, as Catholic Canadians, I mean, you look at the state of the Catholic Church in Canada 40 or 50 years ago and today, and you don't need an American up here telling you about uh, what might be the great apostasy. Um, this teaching about the great apostasy to, to precede the second coming is, uh, comes from scripture. Um, uh, there are two passages that I um, particularly like. Um, let me see if I have it here. I may not have it here. It's when Jesus, shortly before the crucifixion, says, when the Son of Man returns, will he even find faith left on the face of the earth? It's one of the passages from scripture that's the basis of this teaching about the great apostasy. So, um, yeah, it's Luke 18 is that passage. Um, now, oh, and let me read another passage about um, the end times from scripture. This is from 2 Timothy 3, and I'll leave it up to your imaginations whether we might be seeing that today. Um, but understand this, that in the last days there will come times of stress, for men will be lovers of self, lovers of money, proud, arrogant, abusive, disobedient to their parents, ungrateful, unholy, inhuman, implacable, slanderers, profligates, fierce, haters of good, treacherous, reckless, swollen with conceit, lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God. Um, so anyway, that I just leave up to people's imaginations whether uh, the current times might qualify to be at least the beginning of uh, the great apostasy. By the way, as a little bit of a digression, let me say that personally, I think the breakdown of the family is probably um, the greatest sign of the great apostasy because 
Um, when love grows cold, and that's another passage, uh, which I actually, I'm, I apologize for not remembering offhand, but there's a passage in one of the epistles about love growing, men's love growing cold being a sign of the end times. And you know, when you have this situation where you know, fewer than 50% of marriages are for life, and where fewer than 50% of children, at least in the United States, grow up with both of their natural parents. I mean, the, 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 you know, by the time um, people are unable to love their spouses, unable to love their children, and unable to love their parents, I mean, love has really grown cold. And, um, so anyway, I guess I'm here to <laughs> bring good news. Because I guess it's actually a source of some consolation or cheer to me, which is I don't know whether these are um, the, the times preceding the second coming or not. But um, we do know one thing, which is that um, according to scripture, according to Catholic dogma, the times preceding the second coming will be awfully dark. They will be terrible. Things will look at least as bleak as they look now, if not bleaker. So whatever happens, the last thing that any Catholic should do is turn around and say, oh my God, God has failed, or the world has failed, or things are off track. Things are never off track. God is entirely sovereign. The enemy of man's salvation has no sovereign authority or power whatsoever, right? The devil would not exist for a nanosecond if he weren't supported in his existence by God. He would not get away with a single instance action if it weren't permitted by God, and in some sense ordained by God. Whatever happens, that does not mean the world is out of control. If things get really, really, really bad, the worst that could mean is that Jesus' second coming is around the corner. Amen. So if we want Jesus' second coming to be around the corner, we better pray for the conversion of the Jews. So let me get back to that part of my talk. So let me go back to Romans 11 and wrap up talking about this mysterious role of the conversion of the Jews in the second coming. So starting at the beginning of Romans 11, I ask, this is St. Paul speaking. I ask then, has God rejected his people by no means? I myself am an Israelite, a descendant of Abraham, a member of the tribe of Benjamin. God has not rejected his people whom he foreknew. Okay, so a flat statement after the death of Christ that the election of the Jews still continues. God did not reject his people despite their infidelity to him. And by the way, if you read the Old Testament, that's not surprising because for those 2,000 years, the Jews were continually unfaithful to God. So going back to Romans 11, to St. Paul, what then? Israel failed to obtain what it sought. The elect obtained it, but the rest were hardened as it is written. God gave them a spirit of stupor, eyes that should not see and ears that should not hear, down to this very day. Let their eyes be darkened so that they cannot see. Okay, I talked about that before. The blindness of the Jews to recognize Jesus wasn't only due to their own stubbornness and hard-heartedness, but was mysteriously in itself a part of divine providence. As Paul says, let their eyes be darkened so that they cannot see. But then Paul goes on to explain why things were done this way. So I ask, have they stumbled so as to fall? By no means. Through their trespass, salvation has come to the Gentiles. Okay? Through their trespass, salvation has come to the Gentiles. So what's St. Paul saying here? That if the Jews had not failed to recognize Jesus, salvation would not have come properly to the Gentiles. Now you see this in the book of Acts. You see the danger. The situation is the following. Jesus was a Jew. All of the 12 apostles were Jews. The Holy Family were, of course, Jews. Everyone he preached to in his life was a Jew. All of those 3,000 who were converted on Pentecost Sunday were Jews. It looked like Christianity was only for Jews, right? The, think of the danger that that would pose if everyone thought this was a new like, sect of Judaism, a new form of Judaism, a fulfillment of Judaism which is only open to Jews. What was the first church council called for? What was the first crisis in the church? The Council of Jerusalem, which is described in Acts, I think it's chapter 14, but I wouldn't bet my life on it, uh, it's around chapter 14. The Council of Jerusalem, about 51 AD, was called to determine the question, can Gentiles be Christians, or is Christianity only for Jews? 
Okay, that was the first crisis in the church. Are we supposed to allow Gentiles into the church? Now, this danger of thinking that Christianity was only for Jews was avoided by the failure of the Jews to enter the church, right? Because pretty soon, most of the people coming into the church were Gentiles, and pretty soon it became obvious that the church was for Gentiles. But if, you know, if the first you know, two and a half million out of three million Christians had been the Jews, it would have been much harder to make it evident that Christianity was for the whole world and was for Gentiles also on an absolutely equal basis, right? That danger was avoided precisely by the Jews' failure to recognize Christ. So let me go back to St. Paul. Now, if their trespass means riches for the world, and if their failure means riches for the Gentiles, how much more will their full inclusion mean? For their rejection means the reconciliation of the world. What will their acceptance mean but light from the dead? Okay? So that he's saying exactly what I said. Their trespass meant riches for the world, and their failure meant riches for the Gentiles, right? It was their failure that opened up the church to the Gentiles, opened up salvation to the Gentiles. But if that's the case, how much more will their success mean? How much more will their full inclusion mean? If their rejection meant the reconciliation of the world, what will their acceptance mean but life from the dead? Now, when St. Paul says life from the dead, I think he's referring to the great apostasy. And when he says, what will their acceptance mean but life from the dead, I think what he's referring to is that the influx of Jews into the church in the latter days will be the counterba countervailing force to the great apostasy. It will be the last surge of revitalization into the church that counterbalances the falling away from the faith of the Gentiles and makes way for the second coming. I'd like to talk more about that but I'm running out of time, so let me go on um, with St. Paul. If, uh, he, now, he goes into his image, his central image of the interplay between Jew and Gentile in salvation history, and it's his image of the olive tree. And what St. Paul says is the following. If the root is holy, so are the branches. But if some of the branches were broken off, and you, a wild olive shoot, were grafted in their place to share the richness of the olive tree, do not boast over the branches. If you do boast, remember, it was not you that support the root, but the root that supports you. You will say branches were broken off so that I might be grafted in. That is true. But even the others, if they do not persist in their unbelief, will be grafted back in again, for God has the power to graft them in again. For if you have been cut from what is by nature a wild olive tree and grafted contrary to nature into a cultivated olive tree, how much more will these natural branches be grafted back into their own olive tree? Okay, so this is St. Paul's central image, right? It's like the olive tree of salvation, you know, was originally the Jews and was rooted in Judaism. Some branches were cut off, those are the Jews who rejected Christ, in order to uh, graft in wild olive branches, which were the Gentiles. But if you're one of those grafted in wild olive branches, don't boast over the cut off original olive branches, because remember, God has the power to graft them back in again, and when he does, how much better will they be suited to the tree, because they're already part of it. Okay, it's not me who's saying this, it's St. Paul saying it. Don't blame me. So, so um, going back to um, the letter to the Romans, um, uh, St. Paul continues, lest you be wise in your own conceits, I want you to understand this mystery, brethren. A hardening has come upon part of Israel until the full number of the Gentiles come in, and so all Israel will be saved. So we see this kind of, of swinging back and forth of the pendulum of salvation, that it first came to the Jews, and then it came to the Gentiles, in some sense excluding the Jews, until the full number of Gentiles come in, and then it swings back and picks up the Jews, and then the church is complete, salvation history is complete, and the world is ready for the second coming. Now then St. Paul, very interestingly, goes on to talk about why God arranged things this way. So let me go back to the letter to the Romans. As regards the gospel, they, meaning the Jews, are enemies of God for your sake. But as regards election, they are beloved for the sake of their forefathers. For the gifts and the call of God are irrevocable. Just as you were once disobedient to God, but have now received mercy because of their disobedience, so they have now been disobedient in order that by the mercy shown to you, they also may receive mercy. For God has consigned all men to disobedience, that he, have may, that he, he may have mercy upon all. Amen. So what, God, what St. Paul is saying here is, look, if, if, if the Jews had, a, had a followed Jesus and entered the church, 
they would have never gone through a period of disobedience. So they would have felt like they deserved salvation, right? The Gentiles originally were in a state of disobedience to God, so that when they entered the church, they already knew that it was a sovereign act of God's mercy. But if the Jews hadn't passed through a period of disobedience, they, it would not have been apparent to them that this was a sovereign act of God's mercy and not due to anything they earned. By making them pass through this period of disobedience, God has made it perfectly clear that their salvation, too, is a sovereign act of mercy. As St. Paul says, as God has consigned all men to disobedience, that he may have mercy upon all. So you see, so he even explains the beauty and the logic of this pattern of salvation history. And then he closes the chapter with the only possible uh, words, which is a prayer of praise. Oh, the depths of the riches and wisdom and knowledge of God, how unsearchable are his judgments and how inscrutable his ways. For who has known the mind of the Lord or who has been his counselor or who has given him a gift that he might be repaid? For from him and through him and to him are all things. To him be glory forever. Amen. Amen. Now, let me close with a prayer for the conversion of the Jews. Um, I will have uh, these prayer cards. I still have uh, some left. I'll have them on my table for free. See, I'm at least half converted, right? Um, I'll, have, I'll have books and DVDs and CDs and stuff to sell, but the prayer cards are free. But again, I, only ask, I ask you to only take two or three, so they're not for everyone who's interested. But let me uh, read this prayer. These are all uh, canonical Catholic prayers for the conversion of the Jews, because the Catholic Church used to be less shy than it is today about praying for the conversion of the Jews. Now, this prayer that I'm going to read is from the breviary for the week of Christian unity. Day seven used to, is dedicated to praying for the conversion of the Jews. So let me read this from the breviary, and I am inviting you silently to pray along. And if you want to uh, pick up a prayer card afterwards, um, I encourage you to, because that's what I'm in this for, um, is encouraging the prayer for the conversion of the Jews. So here's uh, what will be my closing prayer. O oh God, who manifests your mercy and compassion towards all peoples, have mercy upon the Jewish race, once your chosen people. You selected them alone out of all the nations of the world to be the custodians of your sacred teachings. From them you raised up prophets and patriarchs to announce the coming of the Redeemer. You will that your only Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior, should be a Jew according to the flesh, born of a Jewish maiden in the land of promise. Listen to the prayers we offer you today for the conversion of the Jewish people. Grant that they may come safely to a knowledge and love of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Messiah foretold by their prophets, and that they may walk with us in the way of salvation. Amen. Amen, Amen and thank you. Roy Shulman, thank you. God bless you. He has blessed you. Fantastic.